Hi, Miss Hernandez here. And we're back again with our novel, Island of the Blue Dolphins. And today we're gonna to be reading chapter nine and 10. And I'm gonna do what I did last time. You'll see the pages of the book and read along with me and I'll pause every so often so you can answer some questions. Cause as we read, right, we should always reflect on what we are reading. So we comprehend the story, meaning we really understand it and we could tell others about it later if they asked us about it. Also, we wanna make sure we're practicing the vocabulary. So we'll be looking at more of that as we read. And I just wanted to say, I hope you're all doing well. I hope that even though it's rainy, you're still getting active, maybe doing some little videos like I put in in our slides, doing some dancing or exercising. So again, try to find those things to keep you busy, whether that's reading, playing video games, but only for a little bit, or just doing some activities with your family. So hope you're all doing well and enjoy this reading. Chapter nine. I do not remember much of this time, except that many suns rose and set. I thought about what I was going to do now, that I was alone. I did not leave the village. Not until I had eaten all of the abalones did I leave and then only to gather more. Yet I do remember the day that I decided I would never leave, live in the village again. It was a morning of thick fog and the sound of far off waves breaking on the shore. I had never noticed before how silent the village was. Fog crept in and out of the empty huts. It made shapes as it drifted and they reminded me of all the people who were dead and those who were gone. The noise of the surf seemed to be the voices speaking. I sat for a long time, seeing these shapes and hearing the voices, until the sun came out of the fog, and the fog vanished. Then I made a fire against the wall of the house. When it was burned to the earth, I started a fire in another house. Thus, one by one, I destroyed them all so that there was only ashes left to mark the village of Galas Ott. There was nothing to take away with me except a basket of food. I therefore traveled fast, and before night fell, I reached the place where I decided to live until the ship returned. This place lay on a headland, a half league to the west of Coral Cove. There was a large rock on that headland, and two stunted trees. Behind the rock was a clear place about ten steps across, which was sheltered from the wind, from which I could see the harbor and the ocean. A spring of water flowed from a ravine nearby. That night, I climbed onto the rock to sleep. It was flat on top and wide enough for me to stretch out. Also, it was so high from the ground that I did not need to fear the wild dogs while I was sleeping. I had not seen them again since the day they had killed Ramo, but I was sure they would soon come to my new camp. The rock was also a safe place to store the food I had brought with me and everything I should gather. Since it was still winter and any day the ship might return, there was no use to store food I would not need. This gave me time to make weapons to protect myself from the dogs, which I felt would at some time attack me to kill them all, one by one. I had a club I found in one of the huts, but I needed a... Alright, so on this page, page 48, in this book I've kind of seen a theme of a lot of landforms that are mentioned, which are by the ocean and on islands. And I don't live on the ocean or near the island, even though I've been to them. So a lot of these words I'm not familiar with, so I figured neither are you, or you might be. But still, I wanted you guys to look up the meaning of the word headland. So it says, this place lay on a headland, a half league to the west of Coral Cove. There was a large rock on the headland and two stunted trees. So using the context clues and looking up some information on the internet, try to find what headland means. So on this same page, I want you to also think about why do you think Karana burned the village of Galas Ant? Wouldn't she want to save the land? How come she didn't take anything from the village? I want to hear your ideas about that. So go ahead and stop and think about that question. Bow and arrows and a large spear. The spear which I had taken from the slain dog was too small. It was good for spearing fish and little else. The laws of Galas Ant forbade the making of weapons by women of the tribe, so I went out to search for any that might have been left behind. I went first to where the village had been and sifted the ashes for spearheads, and then finding none, to the place where the canoes were hidden, believing that the weapons might have been stored there with the food and water. I found nothing in the canoes under the cliff. Then, remembering the chest the Aleuts had brought to the shore, I set out for Coral Cove. I had seen that chest on the beach during the battle, but did not remember that the hunters had taken it with them when they fled. The beach was empty except for rows of seaweed washed in by the storm. 
The tide was out, and I looked in the place where the chest had lain. It was just below the ledge. Ulapa and I had stood on while we watched the battle. The sand was smooth, and I dug many holes with a stick. I dug in a wide circle, thinking that the storm might have covered it with sand. Near the center of the circle, the stick hit something hard, which I was sure was a rock. But as I dug deeper with my hands, I saw it was the black lid of the chest. All morning I worked, moving the sand away. The chest lay deep from the washing of the waves, and I did not try to dig it out, but only so I could raise the lid. As the sun rose high and tide came rushing up the beach and filled the hole with sand, each wave covered the chest deeper until it was completely hidden. I stood on the place, bracing myself against the wave so that I would not have to look for it again. When the tide turned, I began to dig with my feet, working them down and down, and then with my hands. The chest was filled with beads and bracelets and earrings of many colors. I forgot about the spearheads I had come for. I held each of the trinkets to the sun, turning them so they caught the light. I put on the longest string of beads, which were blue, and a pair of blue bracelets, which exactly fitted my wrists, and walked down the shore, admiring myself. I walked the whole length of the cove. The beads and the bracelets made tinkling sounds. I felt like the bride of a chief as I walked there by the waves. I came to the foot of the trail where the battle had been fought. Suddenly I remembered those who had died there, and the men who had brought the jewels I was wearing. I went back to the chest. For a long time I stood beside it, looking at the bracelets and the beads hanging from my beautiful and bright in the sun. They do not belong to the lutes, I said. They belong to me. But even as I said this, I knew that I never would wear them. One by one, I took them off. I also took the rest of the beads from the chest. Then I walked through the waves and flung them all far away, out into the deep water. There were no iron spearheads in the chest. I closed the lid and covered it with sand. I looked along the bottom of the trail, but finding nothing there that I could use, gave up my search. For many days I did not think of the weapons again, not until the wild dogs came one night and sat under the rock and howled. They were gone at daylight, but not far. During the day I could see them slinking through the brush, watching me. That night they came back to the headland. I had buried what was left of my supper, but they dug it up, snarling and fighting among themselves over the scraps. Then they began to pace back and forth at the foot of the rock, sniffing the air, for they could smell my tracks and knew that it was some, somewhere near. For a long time, I lay on the rock while they trotted around below me. The rock was high and they could not climb it, but I was still fearful. As I lay there, I wondered what would happen to me if I went against the law of our tribe, which forbade the making of weapons by women, if I did not think of it at all and made those things which I must have to protect myself. Would the four winds blow in from the four directions of the world and smother me as I made the weapons? Or would the earth tremble, as many said, and bury me beneath its falling rocks? Or, as others said, would the sea rise over the island in a terrible flood? Would the weapons break in my hands at the moment when my life was in danger, which is what my father had said? I thought about these things for two days, and on the third night, when the wild dogs returned to the rock, I made up my mind that no matter what befell me, I would make the weapons. In the morning I said about it, though I felt very fearful. I wish to use a sea elephant's tusk for the tip of the spear, because it is hard and of the right shape. There are many of these animals on the shore near my camp, but I lacked a weapon which, with which to kill one. Our men usually hunted them with a strong net made of a bull kelp, which they threw over an animal while it slept. To do this, at least three men were needed, and even then the sea elephant often dragged the net into the sea and got away. I used instead the root of a tree which I shaped into a point and hardened it in the fire. This I bound to a long shaft with the green sinews of a seal I killed with a rock. So on this page, Karana talks about how she's fearful to make weapons because her tribe had a rule that women weren't allowed to make weapons. What does this kind of remind you of in history? What other examples are there of things women couldn't do? The bow and arrows took more time and caused me great difficulty. I had a bowstring, but wood which could be bent, and yet had the proper strength was not easy to find. I searched the ravines for several days before I found it, trees being very scarce on the island of blue dolphins. Wood for the arrows was easier to find, and also the stone for the tips and the feathers for the ends of the shafts. Gathering these things was not the most of the trouble. I had seen the weapons made, but I knew little about it. I had seen my father sitting in the hut on winter nights scraping the wood for the shafts, 
chipping the stones for the tips and tying the feathers, yet I had watched him and really seen nothing. I had watched, but not with the eye of one who could ever do it. For this reason, I took many days and had many failures before I fashioned a bow and arrows that could be used. Wherever I went now, whether to the shore when I gathered shellfish or to the ravine for water, I carried this weapon in a sling on my back. I practiced with it and also with the spear. The dogs did not come to the camp during the time I was making the weapons, though every night I could hear them howling. Once, after the weapons were made, I saw the leader of the pack, the one with the gray hair and the yellow eyes, watching me from the brush. I had gone to the ravine for water and he stood on the hill above the spring looking down at me. He stood very quiet with only his head showing over the top of a choya bush. He was too far away for me to reach him with an arrow. Wherever I went during the day I felt secure with my new weapons and I waited patiently for the time when I could use them against the wild dogs that had killed Ramo. I did not go to the cave where they had lay their lair since I was sure that they would soon come to the camp. Yet every night I climbed onto the rock to sleep. After the first night I spent there, which was uncomfortable because of the uneven places in the rock, I carried dry seaweed up from the beach and made a bed for myself. It was a pleasant place to stay there on the headland. The stars were bright overhead, and I lay and counted the ones that I knew and gave names to many that I did not know. In the morning, the gulls flew out from the nest in the crevices of the cliff. They circled down to the tide pools, where they stood first on one leg and then the other, splashing water over themselves and combining their feathers with the curved beaks. Then they flew off down the shore to look for food. Beyond the kelp beds, pelicans were already hunting, soaring high over the clear water, diving straight down, if they sighted a fish to strike the sea with a great splash that I could hear. So at the top of this page on page 54, it says, He stood very quiet with only his head showing over the top of a choya bush. C-H-O-L-L-A. I'm going to look up what the choya bush is. You should look it up too. I also watched the otter hunting in the kelp. These shy little animals had come back soon after the lutes had left, and now there seemed to be as many of them as before. The early morning sun shone like gold on their glossy pelts. Yet as I lay there on the high rock looking at the stars, I thought about the ship which belonged to the white men. And at dawn, as light spread across the sea, my first glance was toward the little harbor of Coral Cove. Every morning I would look for the ship there, thinking that it might have come in the night. And each morning I would see nothing except the birds flying over the sea. When there were people in Galas Ot, I was always up before the sun and busy with many things. But now that there was little to do, I did not leave the rock until the sun was high. I would eat and then go to the spring and take a bath in the warm water. Afterwards, I went down to the shore, where I could gather a few abalones and sometimes spear a fish for my supper. Before darkness fell, I climbed onto the rock and watched the sea until it slowly disappeared in the night. The ship did not come, and thus winter passed and the spring. Okay. So notice at the end of chapter 9, it says, The ship did not come, and thus winter passed and the spring. So in stories, it's important to pay attention to kind of the timeline, right? What's going on? Some stories, it's every day they're telling a story, or there's time jumps. And so in this story, it seems like we're going to be moving forward. So if winter and spring passed, what's our next season we'll be in? Chapter 10. Summer is the best time on the island of the Blue Dolphins. The sun is warm then, and the winds blow milder out of the west, sometimes out of the south. It was during these days that the ship might return, and now I spent most of my time on the rock, looking out from the high headland into the east, toward the country where my people had gone, across the sea, that was never ending. Once while I watched, I saw a small object which I took to be a ship, but a stream of water rose from it, and I knew that it was a whale spouting. During those summer days, I saw nothing else. The first storm of winter ended my hopes. If the white men's ship were coming for me, it would have come during the time of good weather. Now I would have to wait until winter is gone, maybe longer. I thought of being alone on the island while so many. Suns rose from the sea and went slowly back into the sea, filled my heart with loneliness. I had not felt so lonely before because I was sure that the ship would return as Matasip had said it would. Now my hopes were dead. Now I was really alone. I could not eat much, nor could I sleep without dreaming terrible dreams. The storm blew out of the north, sending big waves against the island, and winds so strong that I was unable to stay on the rock. I moved my bed to the foot of the rock, and for protection, kept a fire going throughout the night. I slept there five times. 
The first night, the dogs came and stood outside the ring made by the fire. I killed three of them with arrows, but not the leader, and they did not come again. On the sixth day, when the storm had ended, I went to the place where the canoes had been hidden and let myself down over the cliff. This part of the shore was sheltered from the wind, and I found the canoes just as they had been left. The dried food was still good, but the water was stale, so I went back to the spring and filled a fresh basket. I had decided during the days of the storm, when I had given up hope of seeing the ship, that I would take one of the canoes and go to the country that lay toward the east. I remember how Kim Ki, before he had gone, had asked the advice of his ancestors who had lived many ages in the past, who had come to the island from the country, and likewise, he advised Azuma, the medicine man, who had held power over the wind and the seas. But these things I could not do, for Zuma had, killed by, had been killed by the Aleuts, and in all my life I had never been able to speak with the dead, though many times I had tried. Yet I cannot say that I was really afraid as I stood there on the shore. I knew that my ancestors had crossed the sea in their canoes, coming from that place which lay beyond. Kimki too had crossed the sea. I was not nearly so skilled with a canoe as these men, but I must say that whatever might befall me on the endless waters did not trouble me. It meant far less than the thought of staying on the island alone, without a home or companions, pursued by wild dogs, where everything reminded me of those who were dead and those who had gone away. Of the four canoes stored there against the cliff, I chose the smallest, which was still very heavy because it could carry six people. The task that faced me was to push it down the rocky shore and into the water, a distance four or five times its length. This I did by first removing all the large rocks in front of the canoe. I then filled in all these holes with pebbles, and along this path laid down long strips of kelp, making a slippery bed. The shore was steep, and once I got the canoe to move with its own weight, it slid down the path into the water. The sun was in the west when I left the shore. The sea was calm behind the high cliffs. Using the two-bladed paddle, I quickly skirted the south part of the island. As I reached the sand pit, the wind struck. I was paddling from the back of the canoe, because you can go faster kneeling there, but I could not handle it in the wind. Kneeling in the middle of the canoe, I paddled hard, and I did not pause until I had gone through the tides and run fast around the sand spit. There were many small waves, and I was soon wet, but as I came out from behind the spit, the spray lessened and the waves grew long and rolling. Though it would have been easier to go the way they, they slanted, this would have taken me in the wrong direction. I therefore kept on my left hand as well as the island, which grew smaller and smaller behind me. At dusk, I looked back. The island of the blue dolphins had disappeared. This was the first time that I felt afraid. There were only hills and valleys of water around me now. When I was in a valley, I could see nothing, and when the canoe rose out of it, only the ocean stretching away and away. Night fell, and I drank from the basket. The water cooled my throat. The sea was black, and there was no difference between it and the sky. The waves made no sound among themselves, only faint noises as they went under the canoe or struck against it. Sometimes the noises seemed angry, and at other times like people laughing. I was not hungry because of my fear. The first star made me feel less afraid. It came out low in the sky, and it was in front of me, toward the east. Other stars began to appear all around, but it was this one I kept my gaze upon. It was in the figure that we call a serpent, a star which shone green and which I knew. Now and then it was hidden by mist, yet it always came out brightly again. Without this star, I would have been lost, for the waves never changed. They came always from the same direction and in a manner that kept pushing me away from the place I wanted to reach. For this reason, the canoe made a path in the black water like a snake, but somehow I kept moving toward the star which shone in the east. This star rose high and then I kept the north star on my left, the one we call the star that does not move. The wind grew quiet. Since it always dies down when the night was half over, I knew how long I had been traveling and how far away the dawn was. About this time, I found that the canoe was leaking. Before dark, I had emptied one of the baskets in which food was stored and used it to dip out the water that came over the sides. The water that now moved around my knees was not from the waves. I stopped paddling and worked with the basket until the bottom of the canoe was almost dry. Then I searched around, filling in the dark among, along the smooth planks, and found the place near the bow where the water was seeping through a crack, 
as long as my hand and the width of my finger. Most of the time it was out of the sea, but it leaked whenever the canoe dipped forward in the waves. The places between the planks were filled with black pitch, which we gather along the shore. Lacking this, I tore a piece of fiber from my skirt and pressed it into the crack, which held back the water. Dawn broke in a clear sky, and as the sun came out of the waves, I saw that it was far off on my left. During the night, I had drifted south of the place I wished to go, so I changed my direction and paddled along the path made by the rising sun. There was no wind on this morning, and the long waves went quickly under the canoe. I therefore moved faster than during the night. I was very afraid, but more hopeful than I had been since I left the island. If the good weather did not change, I would cover many leagues before dark. Another night and another day might bring me within sight of the shore toward which I was going. Not long after dawn, while I was thinking of this strange place and what it would look like, the canoe began to leak. This crack was between the same planks, but was a larger one and close to where I was kneeling. The fiber I tore from my skirt and pushed into the crack held back most of the water, which seeped in whenever the canoe rose and fell with the waves. Yet I could see that the planks were weak from the end from one end to the other, probably from the canoe being stored so long in the sun, and that they might open along the whole length if the waves grew rougher. It was suddenly clear to me that it was dangerous to go on. The voyage would take two more days, perhaps longer. By turning back to the island, I would not have nearly so far to travel. Still, I could not make up my mind to do so. The sea was calm and I had come far. The thought of turning back after all this labor was more than I could bear. Even greater was the thought of the deserted island I would return to, of living there alone and forgotten, for how many suns and how many moons. The canoe drifted idly on the calm sea while these thoughts went over and over in my mind, but when I saw the water seeping through the crack again, I picked up the paddle. There was no choice except to turn back toward the island. I knew that by the best of fortune would I ever reach it. Okay, so a lot has happened so far in chapter 10. Karana decided that she was going to leave the island to try to find the place where they had planned to go. But she starts facing some troubles. Why do you think her attempt to escape the island failed? And why did she want to leave the island? The wind did not blow until the sun was overhead. Before that time, I covered a good distance, pausing only when it was necessary to dip water from the canoe. With the wind, I went more slowly and had to stop more often because of the water spilling over the sides, but the leak did not grow worse. This was my first good fortune. The next was when a swarm of dolphins appeared. They came swimming out of the west, but as they saw the canoe, they turned around in a great circle and began to follow me. They swam up slowly and so close that I could see their eyes, which are large and the color of the ocean. Then they swam on ahead of the canoe, crossing back and forth in front of it, diving in and out as if they were weaving a piece of cloth with their broad snouts. Dolphins are animals of good omen. It made me happy to have them swimming around the canoe, and though my hands had begun to bleed from the chafing of the paddle, just watching them made me forget the pain. I was very lonely before they appeared, but now I felt that I had friends with me, and it did not feel the same. The blue dolphins left me shortly after dusk, before dusk. They left as quickly as they had come, going on into the west, but for a long time I could see the last of the sun shining on them. After night fell, I could still see them in my thoughts, and it was because of this that I kept on paddling when I wanted to lie down and sleep. More than anything, it was the blue dolphins that took me back home. Fog came with the night, yet from time to time I could see the star that stands high in the west, the red star called Magat which is part of the figure that looks like a crawfish and is known by that name. The crack in the planks grew wider, so I had to stop often to fill it with fiber and to dip out the water. The night was very long, longer than the night before. Twice I dozed kneeling there in the canoe, though I was more afraid than I had ever been. But the morning broke clear, and in front of me lay the dim line of the island, like a great fish sunning itself on the sea. I reached it before the sun was high, and the sand spit and its tides bore me into the shore. My legs were stiff from kneeling, and as the canoe struck the sand, I fell when I rose to climb out. I crawled through the shallow water and up the beach. There I lay for a long time, hugging the sand in happiness. I was too tired to think of the wild dogs. Soon, I fell asleep. Okay, so 
So that's the end of chapters 9 and 10. Next time we'll read chapter 11 and 12, I'm doing two chapters at a time now. And I just want to leave you with this last reflection. So it's important when you read stories, any type of story for that matter, whether it's in a novel or in the articles you read, but it's important to try to relate it to you and your own life because it helps you not only remember the story better, but also helps you connect to the characters. So I want you to think about how you would be feeling if you were Karana at this point in the story. Obviously, she's been through a lot. She's faced a lot of things and now she's by herself. So how would you feel? if you were in her situation. So I'll see you next time.